from our studios on Florida's Gulf Coast. This is Women of Grace Live. Join us today as we discuss issues important to your life and faith. Spiritual insight, compelling discussion, practical wisdom. Women of Grace, for such a time as this. Now, here's your host, Johnette Bankovic. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Women of Grace Live. I am Johnette Bankovic. Absolutely delighted to be with you today. Love spending this time with you. It is the day the Lord has made. We should rejoice and be glad in it because He's got abundant blessings in mind for us to receive. And I certainly hope and pray that you've been receiving and experiencing those blessings already today. And we hope that they continue to be showered upon you through our time together during this hour broadcast. We are live as I I say, and that means we want to hear from you. Our phone lines are always open for you. Matt Gabinski mans those lines and does such a great job for us. Be sure to give him a big old greeting when you call in and say, well, happy day to you, Matt. And the way that you can join us and say hello to Matt is by calling us at 800-585-9396. That's 800-585-9396. Nine, six. And that's if you're in North America. If you're outside of North America, we've got a number for you too. We do, we do, we do, we do. And that number happens to start with the country code, which is 1-205-271-2985. It's country code 1-205-271-2985. Eighty-five. That's the way that you can join us right here if you're outside of North America. Love being with you in all manner of media. EWTN is ubiquitous. That means it is everywhere, and indeed it certainly is. And so we invite you to join us any other way you possibly can. We're available to you on Sirius XM Station 130. EWTN app. I'll tell you, last evening, my sister and I went out and we had a little bite to eat. And she was showing some people her EWTN app. I'll tell you, that girl... <laughs> She is a public relations person for the network. So she's showing these people, well, this is how you get the app. And look at here. And she's scrolling down and she's showing everybody everything. So if you don't have the EWTN app, I want to encourage you to get it. Otherwise, I might send my sister to your door. And she can knock on it, and she can show you all of the fine features that are available for you right there on the EWTN app. So we invite you to do that. That means you can listen to EWTN wherever you are. It's a really great thing. Social media, too. I'm just telling you, social media, we're here for you. So all kinds of ways that you can be with us today, and we love that. And today's a special day for me. It really is. I want to tell you why. It's a special day because it's the feast day of one of my very, very favorite saints. And that saint is St. Teresa Benedicta of the Cross, also also known as St. Edith Stein. She has two names because she um, is is a philosopher, was a philosopher, a great intellect, uh, very, very key individual in coming up with um, a philosophy for women with a type of pedagogy attached to it, um, an educational system attached to it, a method by which we train women. And she's been very meaningful to me in my life. Many of you might know her history. She lived during the Second World War era. She was a Jewish girl raised Jew, uh, as a Jew, uh, lost her, her Jewish faith along the way, became an atheist, really, much to her mother's chagrin. Father died at a young age. Mother uh, took up the business. I believe it was a lumber business, made it even more successful than it had been. So she was surrounded by you know a role model that, that showed her what a woman could can do when she's called to do it. And she persevered in the direction of her philosophical studies, obtaining a degree, a doctorate degree in philosophy, a branch of philosophy that was really in its early bloom at that time. <clears throat> and that branch of, uh, of, of philosophy was phenomenology. Why is that important? Well, it's important because our St. John Paul II was also a philosopher and the branch of study of philosophy of which he obtained a doctorate was in phenomenology. So they have that in common. And somehow, I really do think that there was an influence there because I hear Edith in some of what John Paul II gives us on his understanding of who woman is. I also think that another one who was a philosopher at that time really began as a writer, but but developed a, you know, a really strong philosophical background. Don't know if she was ever lettered uh, in philosophy or not. I, I can I can do some research on that and find that out. But but she's somebody else that I love very much. Gertrude, G-E-R-T-R-U-D, not Gertrude, but Gertrude, which I think probably is the 
I, you know, I don't her the national name for Gertrude, Gertrude von Lefort. And she wrote a book called Eternal Woman. She also wrote a lovely book called Song, uh, Song of the Scaffold. Uh, and that particular book is about the Carmelite sisters who were killed during the French Revolution. Uh, a beautiful, beautiful work uh, that, that she writes. She chronicles that moment. <clears throat> it's an historic moment. Really quite a beautiful, touching, deep deep, deep story. But aside from all of that, I, she also had this, this, this concept of who woman is. And, um, and I think that the three of them, they were, they were contemporaries. Um, so I think that there, there was some influence. Uh, Edith, uh, older than our Holy Father, uh, by, 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 you know, probably a good half generation, um, maybe a little bit more. And, and Gertrude, I think, um, also in that ilk. She wrote The Eternal Woman in 1938, just to give you a sense of that. Anyway, I'm going on about this because what I want to say is um, it, Edith Stein has been so influential in my life and in my work with women. And she, um, along with John Paul II and, and Gertrude von Lefort and others, of course, um, have really helped to shape a perspective that, that I think is necessary and essential for this time. I think that they were forerunners and they were, they were prescient. They, they, they really were prophets in that sense that, that came before to give a message that would one day uh, achieve the fullness that God wanted it to achieve. And, and, um, so we see a lot of work that's being done in this area. And you'll remember that Pope Francis, one of the famous things that he said uh, at the beginning of his pontificate was that what is needed is a new theology of woman or a deeper theology of woman. And that's really the work that we've been about through Women of Grace for all of these years. And and I think it comes from the heart of the church, you know. Um, I, you know, I don't know how it is in, in other people's apostolic works, but in mine, it wasn't something that I set out to do. I didn't set out to do a specific work, uh, you know, for women. That was not the direction I was in. I was I was a general evangelist, you know, a generalist in evangelization, you know, preaching the word of God to both men and women. And I still do that. And of course, our television program, our radio program uh, reaches the hearts of men and women. And, and frequently, we have more male callers than female. We have lots of men who come up to me all over the place and say, we watch Women of Grace. I watch Women of Grace with my wife every day, or I watch it at night by myself, or whatever the case may be, you know. But the fact of the matter is, I always say, as you know, real men watch and listen to Women of Grace, and I believe that that's true. But there is a dynamic that goes on within the context of what we do that that is geared towards women. But that wasn't the way that I started. I think it was something that um, was... Um, made apparent to me as time went on that this was the way I was to go. It's a long story. I'll tell you that whole big long story another day. But but all of that to say that that one of the great influences was Edith Stein. And it wasn't that the, the call for women came after all of this, you know, uh, involvement with reading about women and getting to know what the church teaches about women, going back to Pius Twelfth and beyond that, of course, to the ones that I mentioned earlier. But but it, 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 it kind of sprung forth from that. I began to see, well, there's a pattern that's developing here. Um, my interest is being carved and shaped in a certain fashion, and I find myself being invited to speak to more and more women. Something is going on here, and I really need to pay heed to that, and I really need to pray about that and ask Lord, what are you saying and what are you doing here? And, and so it kind of sprung from that uh, all the way to the development of and the <clears throat> founding of our Benedicta Leadership Institute for Women, our Benedicta Leadership Institute for Women, which was already in play before Pope Francis um, stated those, those words about what was needed was a new theology for women or a deeper theology for women. And so we have been about the business of, of working towards an end in that regard, really just waiting to see what God was going to do. You know, the sense, you know, start this. Okay, so we did. So what do we do with it now? Well, you know, we began by, by giving these Benedictine Leadership Institutes prior to our, our retreats, prior to our conferences, which we, we still do. We've renamed them, however, Benedictine Leadership Enrichment Seminars, okay? And that's for a reason, because the Institute actually... <clears throat> Uh, became uh, became part of uh, Orchard Lake Schools, part of St. Cyril and Methodius Seminary in Orchard Lake, Michigan, uh, over numbers of years of, of conversation and discussion, um, then 
we were asked to develop a curriculum for Catholic women's leadership in the Masters of Theology program there. And I had been longing for a certification program. This was more than I anticipated. Certification program came with that. And for various and sundry reasons, primarily meeting the needs of our women who were asking for distance learning, the Benedicta Leadership Institute for Women has been relocated. And it's been relocated to Holy Apostles College and Seminary in Cromwell, Connecticut, a leader, really a pioneer in distance learning. They have it down pat. And now the Benedicta Leadership Institute for Women has expanded beyond the certification uh, for women uh, with a certification in Catholic Women's Leadership and beyond the master's program uh, in a sense that it's backed up. So we are now offering a Bachelor of Arts degree in Catholic Women's Leadership through Holy Apostles College and Seminary. Uh, the Benedicta is also through Holy Apostles offering a, um, a, a, a dual enrollment for young women who want to begin to achieve and acquire college credit while they're still in high school uh, through distance learning. We have also begun uh, a, a certification program without college credit, a certification program with college credit, and the master's of, uh, a master's of arts degree in pastoral studies uh, with a concentration in Catholic women's leadership. So now the whole gamut is covered with the exception of a doctoral degree. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see if the Lord has that in his crosshairs. But this is a whole lot that's happening right now. So I want to give you the opportunity to get get out to our website, womenofgrace.com. That's womenofgrace.com. And to, to click on the leadership uh, tab that's at the top. I think it's in the purple bar at the top. Click on that, and it'll take you out to a page where you can read all about it. You can begin to get information there. And we are happy to assist you uh, in, in making this kind of of, of academic effort uh, to achieve something that I think is absolutely on the cusp on the cusp of what is needed right now. This is, this is we're burgeoning new territory here. This is new pioneering. I also want to mention that one of our listeners some time ago, and this is going back about, oh my goodness, maybe four years now, uh, 2014 maybe, it was the fall of 2014. That's what I think it was. Okay, so that's going back three years now. I received an email from a gentleman who listens, and he says, Janet, you love our blessed lady so much. This is the way God works, how he confirms things. And we were in discussion then about this master's program. And he said, you know, you love our blessed lady so very much. He said, it would be beautiful if you would develop some kind of educational program that would extol her, uh, that would help uh, for women to understand her more deeply. Well, what he didn't know was that there was already movement in that direction through the Benedicta Leadership Institute. And that, to me, was like, ah, oh, my goodness sakes, this is, this is, this is a... a this is a big, uh, you know, sign from the Lord. Yes, walk forward, move forward in this endeavor. So we want you to find out about it. So go out to womenofgrace.com and read it. If you have a daughter that's thinking about dual enrollment, you know, suggest this to her. It's a fascinating field of study. Of course, in, in addition to all of that, our Women of Grace study series, which really gives you the basic formation, uh, is available for you. Uh, you know, it's, the fall is coming very quickly here. It's time to begin to consider getting your programs started in your parish. If you haven't begun a Women of Grace study in your parish, we want to encourage you to do so. If you've led it once, I really want to encourage you to lead it twice because now there is so much more for you if the Holy Spirit is working in you in this area. So get on out to our website and check it out. All of that being said, I want to remind you too that we're going to be in Albuquerque, New Mexico, uh, September the 8th through the 10th. Beginning on the 7th is the Benedicta Leadership Enrichment seminar. So you can come and get a taste, you know, and, and get a sense of what is it that, that this is about. Uh, I'll be presenting that study. So I'll, I'll be able to give you a really, a, I think, a, a good snapshot of what it's about. You'll be able to interact. We have a, a you know, a workshop portion of that. It's going to be great. We keep the numbers small so that there's a lot of hand on and a lot of personal time with each other. Uh, we come together as the mystical body of Christ in those settings and as sacred sisters. And we explore the dynamic of what God is saying to women in this 21st century. So we want to invite you to consider coming to St. Jude Thaddeus Catholic Church in Albuquerque, New Mexico, se September the 8th through the 10th for our Benedicta, ex for, excuse me, for our Women of Grace National Conference, preceded by the Benedicta Leadership Institute for Women. 
The theme for the conference is Bloom Who You Are, again, centered on who is woman. And I got to tell you what, it is exciting. <laughs> it is so exciting. Oh my goodness, ladies, you are going to be thrilled. We come together in faith. We come together for formation. We come together for fellowship and we have a whole lot of fun. <laughs> So it's just a great opportunity. Well, I'll tell you what, I'm going to give you the numbers again. We're eager to hear from you right here on Women of Grace Live. I'm Johnette Bankovic, delighted to be with you. If you are outside of North America, see, I tricked you that time, didn't I? If you're outside of North America, it's country code 1 205 271 2985. It's country code 1 205 271 2985. If you're in North America, your number country code 1 205. Excuse me. No, it's not. It's 800 585 9396. If you're in North America, 800 585 9396. Nine, six. Join us right here on Women of Grace Live on this absolutely glorious day in the Lord, the feast day of St. Teresa Benedicta of the Cross, St. Edith Stein. Yay! We'll be right back. Stay tuned. Johnette Benkovic here, and I'm heading west to Albuquerque for our Women of Grace National Conference at St. Jude Thaddeus Catholic Church beginning September 8th. Bloom Who You Are is the theme, and our presenters are Father Philip Scott, Kitty Cleveland, Carol Marquardt, Sue Ellen Browder, Susan Potvin of Living Praise, and yours truly. Preceding is the Benedicta Leadership Enrichment Seminar on September 7th. I'm the presenter, and we'll be talking about leadership for the 21st century woman. Details at womenofgrace.com. That's womenofgrace.com. See you there. The Holy Father's prayer intention for the month of August is that artists of our time, through their ingenuity, may help everyone discover the beauty of creation. August 9th, Feast of St. Teresa Benedicta of the Cross, Edith Stein. St. Teresa Benedicta of the Cross said, When night comes, and retrospect shows that everything was patchwork, and much that one had planned left undone, when so many things rouse shame and regret, then take all as is, lay it in God's hands, and offer it up to Him. In this way, we will be able to rest in Him, actually to rest, and to begin the new day like a new life. Let us reflect. Ah, thank you, St. Teresa Benedicta of the Cross. What now may I lay at God's hands and offer up to Him, that I might rest and begin the new day like a new life? Lord, I give this to you. I trust in you. If you'd like to receive a daily grace line by email, go to womenofgrace.com and click on the word grace line. Then click on the box receive grace lines. That's womenofgrace.com. Hello, this is Bishop Ronald Gaynor of the Diocese of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. This is Michael Warsaw, Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of EWTN. This is Father Mitch Pacwa. Thanks for listening to the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. Welcome back, friends. You're listening to Women of Grace Live. I'm Johnette Benkovic. I am giddy to be with you today. Phone lines are lighting up here. We invite you to join us, too. Let me give you a couple of numbers that you can use so that you can do that. If you're in North America, it's 800-585-9396. That's 800-585-9396. If you're outside of North America, country code 1, 205 2985 is the number for you to use. It's country code 1205 271 2985. Let's get to the phone lines right away here. We're excited to get there. We've got Kathy on the line with us, and she is calling us from Downington, Pennsylvania. Good morning, Kathy. How are you? Hi, Jeanette. I'm doing well, thanks. How about you? Oh, I'm doing very, very well. Thank you for asking. <laughs> I'm so excited. I can't believe I got through. Um, oh, I'm so happy you did. Yeah. <laughs> So I, um, I heard, I was just listening to you and, and you mentioned, uh, some information about, um, the opportunity to be, to get a certification in the Catholic women's leadership. Yes. And I, I was wondering if you could clarify. So 
um, h- how can I find out more about about this? Because okay. I don't think it's a coincidence <laughs> that I, I heard you talking about this. Well, it's I don't it's think, been on my heart. <laughs> really? Well, there you go. I don't think it's coincidence <laughs> either, so I'm clapping here. I'm very happy about that. Uh, the best thing for you to do, Kathy, is to get out to our website, womenofgrace.com. And okay. out there, if you go out to womenofgrace.com, let me just go out there uh, with you. I mean, I'm looking at it. If Up at the top uh, of the of the website, on the webpage there, you're going to see in the very first uh, uh uh, area to the far left, the word leadership. It's in the there's a pur- uh, lavender purple bar up there, and okay, then there's a pink one underneath that. it. It's in the purple one, and you click on leadership. And when you go there, you see that there's a whole page that's dedicated to an explanation of of what this leadership institute is all about, and our partnership with Holy Apostles College and Seminary and okay. it gives you some indication there so there if you look right down there it talks about the non-credit certification in Catholic women's leadership it's six courses that you would take by distance uh, education most likely we will be having um, enrichment seminars that will float around the country there's there's a lot of things that we will be doing but okay. but for now this is what we have that that is concrete so there are six Great. courses it talks to you about those it gives you some of the names of the uh, educators that will be teaching us, Dr. Gregory Popchak, Dr. Monica Miller, um, Father Joshua Genig, and there will be more. And okay. then it talks to, you know, how, how to get started with this thing. And uh, it, it tells you that you'll have access to all of the resources at Holy Apostles College and Seminary. And then it, uh, it goes on and, and it, it gives you an opportunity here. Uh, let's see, down at the bottom, at the very bottom, uh, it, t- it talks about course pricing, and it says apply today, and you click on that, and that'll take you out there, and you can apply. Now, you can take this for graduate credit hours, uh, the Catholic Women's Leadership Institute, for, ca- for credit hours, which then can be applied if you decide you want to go into and matriculate into a master's program, or if you don't, uh, you know, uh, you can... you. If you don't need those credit hours, you don't have a bachelor's degree or whatever the case may be, you can you can apply those. Uh, you can take it without the credit hours, you know. But you can also apply it to a bachelor. So there's a lot of opportunities there, and we can walk you through what is the best suited opportunity for you. Okay. Oh, that's very exciting. It is exciting, it, isn't it? It sounds wonderful, and it sounds like I can do it as a like an online program. Yes. Because, okay. Great. Mm-hmm. And we're excited great. because it, it opens it up to more women. We were doing it through weekly intensives. Wonderful, except it was restrictive for many. So this now opens up the opportunity for so many women in so many diverse places, actually globally. So we're very excited because we have Women of Grace. Um, and of course, you don't have to have been a woman to have gone through the study program uh, to, to apply for this. But we do have Women of Grace studies going on in, in lots of different countries. And so we think that this is an opportunity for those women as well. So we're very excited about what the Holy Spirit and our Blessed Lady are affecting. And I'm quite certain that it is, it is our lady. (laughs) It's this, it's this holy (laughs) duet doing something here, uh, you know, through the intercession of St. Teresa Benedict of the Cross, whom we believe is very, very much at the heart of, of, of what we're doing, as is her understanding of woman and her pedagogy for woman. Oh, that's beautiful. Well, Well, thank you for, for mentioning that this morning. I'm very excited about it. Well, we are too, and we'd be happy to talk to you. Adora Ibrahim, you see her information over there on the far right. Um, she is our mission outreach coordinator, and she would be delighted to talk with you about it. She is a student in the program, so she can give you personal experience as well as all of the, um, uh, you know, uh, the the uh, academic information that you need to have. So she's a good informer as well as an excellent student. So she'll be able to give you some really good insight. Okay, perfect. Thanks so much, Jeanette. You're welcome, Kathy. God bless you today. Bye-bye now. How beautiful. You know, this is the way the Holy Spirit works. It's just a marvelous thing that's going on. All right, let's go to Christine. She's calling us from West Virginia. And I do believe, Christine, you called in yesterday, so I'm so happy that you called back today. Good morning to you. Hi, Christine. Are you there? Yes, I am. There she is. Good girl. Yes, yes, yes. You called yesterday. Am I right, Christine? Yes, I did. Yes. Oh, thanks I'm so glad. You're welcome, and thanks so much for for calling us back. I appreciate that. Um, my question um, was that about knowing about God's will. But five thirty this morning, I was watching Mother Angelica's program from Monday that I had taped. Uh huh. She had spoke about 
God's ordaining and permitting will. Yes. I think I think sometimes we often use God's permitting us to do something as ordaining will so that we can justify doing our will instead of His. And I was wondering okay. if you could kind of help us to go through, you know, how do we really know if it's something we should be doing as ordaining or permitting will? Okay. Well, uh, the, the use of the term ordaining is a new one to me, so I, I don't quite know how Mother defined that. Uh, so I'm going to have to look that up after our program is over. <clears throat> but typically when we talk about God's will, uh, s- classic spiritual writers um, and thinkers will talk about God's signified will and his, his will of good pleasure. <clears throat> and basically, uh, I think that what Mother's referring to there is, is his ordaining will being his signified will, uh, which is the, 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 something that's very clear for us, and then the way in which God works through uh, the, the situations and circumstances in life, which is called his will of good pleasure, or another name for it is his permissive will. His permissive will, however, is not you know, a green light to doing what we want to do and us somehow trying to wedge that into God's will. That That's called trying to justify an offense. <laughs> so that isn't in God's will at all. So let's talk about these two forms of God's will, his signified will and his will of good pleasure and or uh, sometimes called his permissive will. His signified, the signified will of God is that which he lays out for us very clearly. And what are the means by which God lays out his will very clearly? He does it in two ways. He does it through sacred scripture and he does it through the teachings of the church. In sacred scripture, uh, we see God's signified will given to us through the Ten Commandments, and we see God's signified will being made known to us also through the Beatitudes that our Lord Jesus Christ gives us, and that great commandment to love God with all our heart, all our soul, all of our spirit, um, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. So that is God's signified will. So it is never permissible for us, right? Now here we're not talking about permissive will, but it's never okay for us to fudge on God's laws. It's never okay for us to try to justify something that is obviously outside of what God tells us is what we should do and what we should not do. So it's never okay, for example, for us to have an adulterous relationship. It's never okay for us to fudge on our taxes. It's never okay for us to be given too much change and just to keep it and say, I'm being blessed today. (laughs) You know, it, it, those things are never okay. I'm, I'm using, you know, really serious matters and, and to matters that, you know, some would just blow off. But the fact of the matter is God holds us to an accountability according to his signified will given to us through the Ten Commandments. And, and, and those Ten Commandments are not meant to restrict us from happiness and joy. Those Ten Commandments are meant to protect us so that we can experience happiness and joy because there's never any true happiness and joy when we're in bondage to sin. And if we continue to make peace with sin, if we continue to dull our conscience and maybe not even form our conscience according to the law of God, we then set ourselves up for bondage. I'll give you an example. Someone says, oh, well, it doesn't really hurt if I look at these, these, uh, you know, pornographic pictures on the computer once a week. It doesn't really hurt anybody. This is just between me and my computer screen. But what will happen is that individual over time will become addicted to those pornographic pictures. The ability to have relations with his wife or her husband will continue to diminish. It, it, it will lead to other kinds of sins that will take place, um, uh, autonomous kinds of sins. So these, all of these laws of God, the signified will of God is meant to bring us joy and happiness by protecting us from bondage to sin. And we've got to look at them in that way. We, we don't like the thou shalt nots, but the thou shalt nots are really thou Thou shalt not so that thou can, <laughs> you know, and we not we have to understand it that way. Uh, also, the Beatitudes of our Lord Jesus Christ are given to us in sacred scripture. And this talks with us about the way in which we function uh, within the society of man and, and within our relationship with God. These are the thou shalt do's. And, and we need to couple those with the thou shalt nots. And, and then, of course, we've got, we've got um, uh, you know, the, the way in which Holy Mother Church guides us and leads us through her formal teaching. Uh, which is given to us 
in, uh, in, in the apostolic exhortations that come our way, the encyclical letters, uh, the, the proclamations that come from the Roman magisterium. All of this is the signified will of God. And when we come back from our break, we will talk a little bit about the permissive will of God and how that operates and how we know. All right. So stay with us, Christine. Excellent question today. We'll be right back. Al Krista. If you talk to professional philosophers, they are not relativists. Philosophically, relativism can't be justified. People sacrifice objective truth, objective morality on the altar of personal liberty. In other words, in pursuit of what I want to do, I will say, well, that is not binding on me. That's just your opinion. Krista in the afternoons, weekdays at 4 p.m. Eastern on EWTN Radio. If you're currently an EWTN media missionary or just interested in becoming one, we've got some great news. EWTN Media Missionaries has a new and improved website. EWTNMissionaries.com, designed with you in mind. Our new site is loaded with great features and it's easy to navigate. There are so many different ways that you can help EWTN. Join us in sharing the eternal word with the world. Visit EWTNMissionaries.com today. Celebrating 100 years of Fatima with Monsignor Charles Pope. Though the messages of Our Lady of Fatima were completed in 1917, we had from Sister Lucia an important application of the message for our times. She wrote to Cardinal Carlo Caffara in 1981, saying, The final battle between the Lord and the kingdom of Satan will be about marriage and the family. Don't be afraid, she added, because whoever works for the sanctity of marriage will always be fought against and opposed in every way, because this is the decisive issue. Then she concluded, Nevertheless, Our Lady has already crushed his head. Work and pray every day in your own marriage and family to uphold the sanctity of holy matrimony and the family as God sets it forth in the Scriptures. Pray the Rosary every day for marriage and family. Join EWTN as we celebrate the 100th anniversary of Fatima. Visit EWTN.com slash Fatima. Welcome back, friends. You're listening to Women of Grace Live. I'm Janet Benkovic. Happy to be with you today. Did you know we're available to you also on EWTN Radio's YouTube channel and Facebook page? And we look, I, I just on the break here, I was scrolling through both of those to see if there are any questions out there. We take your questions that way too. So we invite you to join us in whichever way you possibly can right here on Women of Grace Live. Obviously, we're available to you also by call and phone. And we invite you to call us right here at Women of Grace Live. Let me give you a number to use if you're in North America. It's 800 585 9396. 800 585 9396. Outside of North America, country code 1 205 271 2985. Country code 1 205 271 2985. Christine's with us from West Virginia. We're talking about God's will. Uh, his perfect will, uh, his signified will, that perfect will is another word for his signified will and or his will of good pleasure or permissive will. So Christine, we talked there about his signified will given to us through sacred scripture uh, and the teachings of the church. So we get that, right? Um, any yeah. questions on that before I move forward to the second part, which has to do with his will of good pleasure or permissive will? No, that was very clear. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Okay, so we measure what we're doing against against uh, those uh, uh, specific uh, 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 laws that God gives to us or, or, or insights, teachings that he provides for us through sacred scripture and the teachings of the church. So if we're considering a certain course of action and that course of action is opposed to one of those commandments, then obviously it's not from God. So, you know, we, we use the example of adultery. So we'll go back to that one. So a, a man becomes attracted to another woman. Uh, he's a married man um, and or vice versa. A married woman becomes attracted to another man. And the question is, well, gee, you know, I, I wouldn't be feeling all of these feelings if it wasn't from God, well, yes, because you would, you can, you can, you can be seriously tempted. Uh, the fact of the matter is, is it okay to move forward? No, and we cannot make it right. There's nothing we can do to make that situation right because it's a sin against the sixth commandment. <clears throat> we, we have the same issue with same-sex attraction. 
We had a call earlier this week about about a, an issue uh, regarding that. And here's the fact of the matter. Um, indeed, we love the, the, the sinner, but we hate the sin. We can't endorse the sin in any way, shape, or form. We're all called to chastity, even in marriage. So chastity uh, is, is, is not a heterosexual or, or a homosexual uh, exclusive virtue. It's a virtue that applies to everyone regardless of where their sexual attraction may lie. Uh, what we do know is that we do not act upon these kinds of feelings because, uh, you know, that is is a sin against the Sixth Commandment. Now, God also has his permissive will. Now, what is that now? And, and, and what is this will of good pleasure? Well, we live in a world that is broken. We live in a world that is torn apart. It's delicate fibers torn apart by the residual effect of original sin and man's cooperation with that residual effect. So sin plagues us, and the corporate weight of sin plagues us. God oftentimes, however, uses the circumstances of life to begin to direct us in a new way. He is always speaking to us, and some of the ways in which he speaks to us is in the midst of the suffering and chaos and craziness that goes on in in, in our everyday lives. Um, he will oftentimes be calling us in new directions through those various kinds of ways. Additionally, <clears throat> that would be his will of good pleasure. Additionally, uh, oftentimes God may have a specific direction that he wants to lead us in. And he will begin to make that known to us. And I want to talk about some of the ways in which he does that. And um, in our in my book, Full of Grace, Women in the Abundant Life, which actually forms, if you will, in air quotes here, the textbook for our Women of Grace Foundational Study, <clears throat> there's a whole section in here called What Does God Want From Us? And uh, I explain about the, the signified will of God and his will of good pleasure. And then I give us some, some touch points um, as, as to how it is that we can begin to determine if we should be going in a certain direction or not. How do we know if God's calling us in a specific direction? And the way in which we do that is, is by taking a look at what has been going on surrounding that. And the very first thing we do is what we discussed in his signified will. The first thing we do is to see if what we're deciding to do or wanting to do is fully in line with sacred scripture, the Ten Commandments and the teachings of the church. Okay? If it's not, clearly it's not from God. So that takes care of that. We we just don't go in that direction. Two, let's suppose that everything there is within the context of sacred scripture and the teachings of the church and God's Ten Commandments. Secondly, then we ask ourselves, is the prompting proceeding from virtue or is it coming from the flesh? That's a little hard one. Uh, that, that can be difficult to determine because, you know, we're a mixed bag. Uh, we always have selfish motivation mixed in with good intention. It just is the way it is. We work hard to root out of ourselves, you know, the selfish motivation, uh, like the what's in it for me question. We work hard at that because what we really want to do is is become an act of total self-donation, which is love. We want to become an act of love. And, but that takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of introspection and prayer. It takes a lot of hours in confession. Uh, and it also takes a great cooperation with virtue, acting in the virtue opposite the, the inclination, the selfish inclination. All right. But, you know, if we can honestly say, look, I really want to do this for the love of God, uh, and that's my primary motivator, then we say, good. All right, we can go to the next step of discernment. The next step is, has the prompting been confirmed in other ways? You know, in other words, is God speaking to us in other ways? Is he speaking to us through other people? Are people coming up and saying, you know, you'd really be good at doing this? I remember when I was... um thinking about, uh, the, you know, God was really impressing on my heart during my prayer time to to begin this this um, apostolic work for women. And I was at a conference in, in uh, uh, Fr at Franciscan University of Steubenville. It was a women's conference. And Kimberly Hahn was one of the speakers along with myself and other women. And um, after I gave my talk, it was a women's conference, Kimberly came up to me and she said, I don't, I'll bet you she doesn't even remember this. Kimberly came up to me and she said, Johnette, she said, have you ever really thought about going into ministry for women? And I said, Kimberly, why would, because I was struggling with this. Remember what I said? I was a, I was a generalist when it came to evangelization. I said, why would I want to do that? Why would I want to cut off 50% of the population? She said, I really think you need to pray about that. 
So I knew I had to take that to prayer. God was speaking. Then I shared with you about receiving the letter from the gentleman three years ago or so uh, that was also another sign from God. So when, when we begin to see these patterns taking place, we need to pay attention to them. And so, you know, if, if, if God's confirming it in other ways, uh, then we put a check. Okay, we move forward in our discernment. And then here's another. Has the prompting withstood the test of time? If it's of God, it's not going to fade away, Christine. It's not going to go the way of enthusiasm. There's a difference between the emotion of enthusiasm and zeal. Zeal is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. Zeal for something is going to grow desire within us. <clears throat> enthusiasm, being an emotion, may you know change in a day or a week or a month even, but not, not something that's really coming from the Holy Spirit. It's going to take root there, and it's not going to leave us alone. So does the desire stay with you? Uh, has it withstood the test of time? And here's another little uh, um, aspect of that too. Has the desire grown? Because the Holy Spirit is going to grow the desire. He's going to grow it in you. Uh, it, it's going to become something that, that uh, ultimately becomes your desire. <laughs> That's what he does. He changes our heart for his desires when we're open and receptive to his will. So we're going to want it so much that, that we're going to be bursting with it. We're going to want to give birth to whatever it is that he's about. And then we check that box out. <clears throat> we also go to this one. Have I sought the counsel of others? Have I taken this, you know, to if we're married? Have I discussed this with my husband or my wife? Um, have I uh, taken it to my spiritual director if I have one? Have I consulted the saints? And by that, I mean, have we read maybe some of the biographies of the saints who were involved in similar kinds of apostolic work or professions? And, and, and you know, have I gained some wisdom from, from their own testimony, the witness of their lives? And have I prayed? Have I, have I, have I asked for saintly intercession? Um, you know, obviously, entrust everything to the Blessed Mother. And, you know, have you talked with a priest about it, maybe, in confession? Father, I'm really sensing this. And if he says, well, you know, make an appointment with me, and we'll talk about this more. Confession's not really the time to talk about things like this and get spiritual direction, but it can be a door opener to an invitation or a, a question, can I meet with you about about these things uh, after, you know, sometime during the course of the week or whatever. So, you know, seek the counsel and advice of others. Talk to other people that are involved in that in that kind of um, in that kind of work and see what they tell you. I have people that call me often and say, you know, I feel like the Lord's calling me in this direction. What what insights can you give me? And and I'm happy to do that. Um, so have I sought the counsel of others? Um, uh, is the supposed prompting or inspiration of grace in conformity with my state in life? You know, how is it going to impact my state in life? My, if you're married, how is it going to impact my marriage? If you have children, how is it going to impact my, my care for my children? Um, if, if you're a religious person, a religious woman or man, how, how, how is this going to impact my vocation? Priest, obviously the same kind of a thing. So is it in accordance with that? If it, if it rubs up against it or it's antithetical to, then it's not coming from God. And then here's a last one. And this one, you know, I, really in, in the book, it's number five, but it really should probably be number seven. Am I going through an emotionally difficult time or am I suffering from mental instability? That's a hard thing to answer. Sometimes, you know, we like, you know, we, we've got to ask that question because typically we need other work prior to being able to accept uh, the call to mission um, in the way in which maybe is going to lead us in a whole new direction or a whole new uh, life pattern. You know, um, if it's emotionally difficult, we don't make decisions if we're newly divorced. We don't make decisions if we've just lost a loved one. We don't make serious decisions if um, we've just had some serious financial reversal. You know, um, we, we wait a spell until until those those uh, delicate fibers of our heart um, have been healed a little bit. And then if we, we have emotional instability, we've really got to consult somebody because we could be seeing things through a distorted lens. And so that's what I would say. That's a really long answer, I know, but there it is. Well, thank you, because I was way off base. Okay. Uh, and so this is really... <laughs> in your, in your understanding, you mean? Yes. Yes, yeah. because I was thinking ordained will was this is the path that God wants us to take. And permitting is when we decide, well, I'm going to take this, I'm going to veer this way instead, and he's just going to allow me to do it because... He's given me free choice. 
Well, let me just say this. He will allow you to do it because he's given you free choice. You know, he will because of your free will. You know, if we choose to sin or if we choose to go against the will of God, you know, God isn't going to stop us from that action. Not typically. Uh, because he, he, he's given us this gift and he will not compromise it. But we can't go off and do what we want to do and say, well, God let me do it, so it must be okay with him. It's not okay with him. Um, we're sinning against him, and then we're sinning again because it's the sin of presumption. We're presuming upon God and upon his mercy. Um, what we need to do, Christine, as we grow in our relationship with him is to desire only what he desires. Only what he desires, because if you think about it this way, <clears throat> and then we're going to move forward, but if, if we think about it this way, God is absolute goodness. I mean, when, when, we, when we say the word good, there is only one good, and that good is God, and everything that is good comes from him. So any goodness that we have comes from God. It's, it's the God life in us. That, that, that is good. And, and so we are not good in and of ourselves in the sense that we manufacture good. We're good because we're made in the image and likeness of God. And the, and the more that we conform to that image and likeness of God, the more of the God life is there, the more goodness, God's own attribute, his good, it, uh, resides within us. So if God is good, then God can only will the good for us. It would be contradictory to his nature to will something that was outside of good for us. He can't do it by virtue of who he is, okay? God cannot will evil. He cannot will sadness for us. He cannot will suffering for us. He doesn't will any of that. However, because of the effects of original sin, these things can happen, and God then takes it, and as it says in Romans eight twenty eight, he works all things to the good for those who are called according to his purposes. If we're seeking him in the midst of the suffering or the, or the contradiction. So here's the deal. If God is good, God can only will the good. If God only wills the good, then if I am going to be truly happy it is important for me to do God's will because his will is the ultimate good for me. So anything that would be antithetical to his will that would be outside of his will is not helpful for me. It's a negative for me. Even though it might bring me momentary pleasure or momentary, uh, you know, uh, 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 sense of happiness, it's not going to last. And we're going to see the deleterious effects of the way that we've chosen but God loves us so much that he offers us a way back, and that way back is through repentance, metanoia, conversion of heart, turning away from what we've been involved in in sin and coming back to him. And then the process of reparation begins. He begins to repair us um, as we continue to move forward in his life <clears throat> of grace and in conformity to his will. Okay? Yes, thank you. You're welcome, honey. God bless you. It's an excellent question. Thank you for your call today. Well, thank you. I appreciate your time. And, and I want to thank you for everything that you do um, because you're our modern-day Teresa helping us all along on our path. And I do thank you for that. Well, I'll tell you, baby girl, I certainly don't deserve that. Anything good is comes by way of the Lord, right? But But I do thank you for wanting to know more about our Lord and how he works in our lives. And that is a very beautiful, beautiful sign of the goodness of your heart, of God in you, Christine. God bless you, honey. Thank but, you. You too. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye. Let's go to Mary. Mary is calling us from Dallas, Texas this morning. Always happy to hear from our Dallas people out there listening to us via Guadalupe Radio Network. Hey, Mary. Uh, hi. Hi. Thank you for your patience, honey. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> So what's going on with Mary today? Okay, my question is, um, I am in my mid-20s going to college, and um, I had a religious vocation. I was a novice with the Carmelites, and then I just discerned that that was in my vocation. Okay. Um, little sister is in her teens, and she is, um, she's been struggling with bisexuality mm -hmm. quite a bit, but completely in denial about it when we ask her, but... Her behavior shows consistently for a year or so now that that's something she's struggling with. So my parents let her come live with me, thinking maybe I would be a good influence on her. And it just doesn't seem to be helping her, even daily mass and, you know, 
frequent con- confession and things, and I'm just really not sure what to do, like what my role is anymore. Yeah. Okay, well, and this is a serious issue, obviously, right? And, um, you know, uh, it's difficult to talk with someone about a disorder if, in fact, they're in denial about it. And I'm assuming that the reason why you think that she has this problem is because of certain manifestations that are going on, maybe the way in which she's dressing or the way in which she's behaving or the people that she's hanging around with. Some of these things giving you indication of this. Is that right, Mary? Yes. Okay. Yes, she actually had a relationship with a girl, and this is a girl. So, I mean, it, but she'll just completely deny it. So, All right. So, th- so there you have it. So um, she's actually acted upon upon this situation here. <clears throat> uh, is she, if she's not open to discussing it with you, um, obviously, and we know this, the very first thing that we do is we pray because everything comes from prayer. Uh, even the insight and the wisdom to know what to do comes from prayer. Uh, so that doesn't necessarily mean it comes during our prayer time, but it will come because our hearts are being made receptive and open to the inspiration and the promptings of the Holy Spirit. So uh, you do pray for her and pray to Our Lady Undoer of Knots. Um, She may also feel, and and this is, you know, how old is this young woman? Uh, Fifteen. Oh, goodness. Okay. So she's in a very formative point in her life. Um, and it, and it becomes very difficult because if she continues to act out on this behavior, then she really begins to set herself up, um, in, in a, in a certain pattern that, um, becomes ever more difficult to extricate oneself from, uh, for all kinds of reasons. I mean, I think that there's a, uh, there's a, an actual, um, imprinting, um, uh, uh, Dr. Nicolosi talks about that. There's an imprinting from first sexual experiences that happens. We set up neural pathways in the brain. Um, additionally too, there's, there's the social realities of this, that the, your, your whole social, uh, 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 uh Context becomes uh, becomes a part of of this particular lifestyle, the, this subculture, and and then it becomes very very hard because your friends are all there, you know how you spend your free time is all there, um, but she's not she's not she's not uh, you know she's 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 young enough where there can be some intervention here, and I would really encourage you to speak with a Christian counselor to see how it is that you can impact in a positive way, especially if she's in denial. You say she's in denial. Maybe she's just denying that she had the relationship, was it, which isn't the same as being in denial about the fact that she's moving in this direction, you know? Um, so yes. I don't know how, how you're using that word. Yes. No, she she denies the relationship is over because that's one reason my parents let her move with me was to get her away from all of the bad peer influences. And now she's yeah. just with me at a really good Catholic college. Um, kind of just mingling with my friends, and even though they're older, they're all good influences. And she right. just completely denies ever having anything, and even now she'll watch um, uh, very pro-homosexual videos and things and just completely deny that she is pro um, anything like that. Okay. Well, certainly the signs are there. So so I would I would suggest that you find a good Catholic counselor who will help with this issue. Uh Secondly, and, 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 and you can do this because you can probably find the Catholic counselor through, through this outreach, and I would, I would check out Courage, C-O-U-R-A-G-E, Courage. It is, uh, it is a Catholic apostolic outreach for those suffering from same-sex attraction. And right. I would also encourage you to become involved in Encourage, which is the outreach of Courage for those who... Uh, are supporting these individuals, parents, sisters, friends, um, so that they can gain the tools that are necessary, uh, and also really just the encouragement uh, to continue to work with the one that they love and, and, and to be supported by groups of people who understand what this suffering is like. And I, I would probably begin there And they will probably be able to introduce you to good counselors that can help. And hopefully uh, you can explain where she is with this in terms of of the denial issues. And they might be able to give you some tools that you can use. All right. Okay, baby. I, you know, I, otherwise, I don't know what you can do. I, I, I think it's wonderful and very you're, a sign of your beautiful, gracious maternal heart to take her in um, and to make yourself available to her to help her through this time. We want this to be a time, not not a life. 
So let's see what we can do. And and I'll lift her up in, in my prayer today. I'll lift you up in my prayer today, too. Okay? Thank you. You're right, welcome, thank you. Mary. God bless you, honey. Bye-bye now. Very big issues that we're facing today. So one of our, our persons out there wants to know what, what to do, you know, about hair and makeup if you feel that you're becoming too vain. Well, you know, we've got, there's, there, it's perfectly all right to have your hair done nicely and to wear makeup. There's no virtue in being dowdy, all right? We're a temple of the Holy Spirit. When it's overboard, and we know it's overboard, then we've got to ask ourselves, what is motivating this? It's usually insecurity, and then we ask God to work on us in our hearts to be healed. Process of healing and restoration. It's been great being with y'all. Gotta go. Bye. Bye.